when you are faced with a decision to keep going and keep betting on yourself and trusting yourself that you have what it takes to pursue and, and achieve whatever that, that dream, that goal, that thing in front of you that you want. When you have that decision point, make that decision for the future version of yourself, not for the present version of yourself. There's a difference between a dream chaser and a dream catcher. Thanks all for tuning in to Dream Catchers, where we make things happen. Dream Catchers was formally launched to unlock the hidden potential in successful, self-motivated individuals who desire to take their life's work to the next level but need support to evolve. We are a collective group of professionals with various backgrounds that use our talents to assist those individuals in realizing their wildest dreams by providing education, inspiration, and direction. This podcast is where we share the lessons we've learned along the way to catching our dreams and give you some context around the how and the why to each approach to put you further ahead on the journey to catching your dreams. Are you ready? Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Dream Catchers podcast. I'm your host, Jerome. I've got the pleasure of having Karen Lenahan with me today. How are you, my friend? I'm doing well, man. I'm living life. Uh, You know, it's 2020, almost end of the year, pandemic time, but you know, family is good. Life is good. So making everything work. Man, you've got a one month old. There's all kinds of great things happening in, in your world. What part of the country are you in? So I'm coming to you from central New Jersey. Beautiful, beautiful central New Jersey. One of the best places in the country, I, I would argue. No question. And one last question before we dive into the interview. What's the best way for listeners to get in contact with you? Yeah, so Two best ways would be head over to my Instagram, Kieran Lenahan Coaching. Uh, that's where I'm most active and people can interact with me, get to know me, see my, my one-month-old daughter and, and wife. Uh, and then you can also head to my website, lenahancoaching.com, if you want to learn more about what I do. Beautiful. All right. So you guys kind of figure it out. He's got a coaching program. So let's dive into this thing, man. Let's talk a little bit about what life was like before you started on this journey to catching your dreams. Yeah. So, you know, as most people, I think who who come on your show, I started out pursuing the traditional path. You know, my mom immigrated to the U.S. from the Philippines. My dad was born and raised in a small town, and they both very much had this mentality instilled in me of, go to school, work really hard and get good grades, you know, listen to your teachers, be a good student, be respectful to people and keep doing that all the way through, through high school. They pushed me to go to uh, a high school that wasn't, you know, the local public school to just broaden my horizons and just help me see that there was more to life than the small town that I grew up in. And then from there went on to college and, you know, had the idea in mind of go to college, get out, get a good job and work there until I retire at 65. And then after that, I can have some fun. Um, you know, that was kind of the, the blueprint that was laid before me. I didn't even know that it was a blueprint. I didn't know that there were options. I just saw everybody else in my life and my family taking this path. And so it wasn't, it wasn't even a question. And so, you know, it came to college, uh, had no idea what to study, didn't know what kind of work I wanted to do, but landed in psychology and I've always been really interested in people understanding why they do what they do. And so I figured, all right, this, this should be a good thing to study. That's when I discovered the overlap between business and psychology. And so that's where I focused a lot of my classes. So came down to graduation year. I had to decide, do I go to grad school, keep studying stuff, or do I get a job? I had combined with my, my girlfriend at the time, uh, now wife, we had over a hundred thousand dollars in student loans combined, um, coming up upon graduation. I knew she was going to have to go to grad school. So I decided the best thing to do would probably be to get a job and start paying those off. So that's what I did. I ended up landing a job back home in New Jersey and worked as an operations manager for an industrial supply company. And so for me, that was, that was to nine to five. It was more like uh, an eight to seven, nine to seven, depending on which department I was in at the time. And yeah, so that was, I mean, that was my introduction to quote unquote, the real world or what I presumed was the way that people live life and found pretty quickly that it wasn't, wasn't all it was cracked up to be. So, um, 
I'd be happy to dive more into what that experience was like, but, but that's kind of the overall picture of, of getting to the nine to five. Um, like I said, early on, I knew within two years, I'm not going to be here at this company. I will be somewhere else. I don't know what that place is, but I will not be here. There were some, just some cultural things, um, just a big portion of the work I felt like I was doing was not utilizing the things that I was actually good at. And it was me fighting against the things that I really didn't like to do. And so, you know, there was definitely some difficult times. You know, I was managing people from a very young age, like people twice my age, having performance conversations with them, compensation conversations with them, um, you know, managing projects and things like that. And it got to the point where I had a pit in my stomach going to work every morning. And for about a year, I spent, you know, I'm a person of faith. I spent a year asking God, like, what, what am I doing here? Why, you know, why do you have me here on this earth? Like what, what purpose am I here to serve? Um, because this job is not it. So I need you to tell me what to do so that I can just go do it and escape this. Um, so pretty much lived in that space for a year, which was, I would say the most difficult year of my life uh, to this point. Uh, and then long story short, came out of that, discovered that coaching was even a thing. Um, rediscovered my passion through working with a coach, rediscovered my passion for business and entrepreneurship. I had had when I was working full-time, I had a few ideas that I had pursued on the side, um, but nothing I really sunk my teeth into. And so when I discovered coaching, I was like, I was pumped because it combined all the things that I loved, working intimately, one-on-one -on -one settings with people in small groups, really diving in and helping them do things with intention and purpose and not just do things because that's what everybody else is doing or because that's what they think they have to do to be quote unquote successful. So that's the, that's a super high level journey to getting to coaching, but there's plenty of, plenty of stories and plenty of ups and downs uh, in that. So you're one of the few people who are open enough to talk about the dark period. Oh yeah. The dark period where it's like, okay, what, what's up? Like, I've had success everywhere. It seemed to be leading me to a place and now I'm just walking around in the dark. The way I've characterized it most is I'm in a room I've never been in before. The, it's total pitch black and there's furniture all over the place. And I'm trying to figure out how to get out, right? And every right. time I step, I bump my knee, I hit my toe. And so then it makes me not wanna move, but not moving is painful because I'm not getting closer to the goal. And so it's like, well, what do you do? And so if you don't mind, let's talk a little bit about the yeah. dark period, because I think there are some people who are searching and seeking and they don't actually know what they're searching and seeking for, but they are asking those uncomfortable questions, knowing that there's something more, something they should be doing, but they aren't doing it yet. Yeah, for sure. You know, this is, you're, you're so right. So many people that I've come across are in this place where they're, they're in that dark room. I love that picture that you described. And the fact that people ask the question, I'm, I'm just like, when I hear that, I'm so happy that people are asking those questions because that's the only way until you have awareness of something, you can't change your situation. So for me, what was helpful, which I realized after a year of, of just uh, fruitless searching and kind of complaining and, and, just being really down, like it, it impacted, you know, every area of my life, right? Like I would come home drained from a day of work doing things I didn't want to do. And I would be a lot less fun to hang out with for my wife, right? Like I'd be with my friends and I would just, you know, be thinking about a crappy day that I had at work. And, you know, so it was impacting every area of my life. What I realized was that I didn't have to figure it out on my own. And so if people get to that point and they do some digging and some searching and they feel like they're, they're stuck and they're not making progress, get some help, whether it be a friend, whether it be a, a trained professional, uh, a coach, like a career coach, somebody who can help uncover and ask you questions to just get all of the thoughts that are in your head out. Because when it's just all in your head, it's, it's not, it's that dark room. Your head becomes that dark room and all you have is these thoughts circulating around your head and they're not helpful. And, and that's what keeps you stuck. So I think being able to talk to somebody, getting an outside perspective is so valuable. So that's, you know, that would be a, a huge piece of advice to people who are in that, that dark room is get, get some outside perspective. So was there a period where you were offered help 
early in the journey, you didn't take it and then eventually you were ready for it? No, there, I can't think of a time when I was offered help, although I'm, I'm sure the help was available to me. But I, my kind of ethos and my, my mindset at that point in time was, I have to figure this out. Like, this is all on me. This is nobody else's problem. I need, like, I need to be the one that figures this out because it's a, you know, you could call it a pride thing. You could call it an ego thing. You can call it, I just had this idea that everything was do it yourself for me. Everything, like I prided myself on, on having that grit. I can figure anything out. So of course I can figure this out. And so because of that, I think I had blinders on. And I think even if there was help available to me, I wasn't, I wasn't even looking for it. So there's no way I would have detected it. Uh, it wasn't until I took those blinders off and said, all right, I need help that the help showed up. Okay. And so who showed up to help you out along the way? Yeah. So it actually happened to be my uncle, funny enough, uh, who I had like a decent relationship with. Um, he was doing, he was running his own business, doing some, some coaching and doing some branding work with uh, creative entrepreneurs. And so he said, look, he lives in Queens. He said, hop on the train, you know, come over, let's spend a few hours and I'm just going to bombard you with questions and help you just think through some thoughts. And I was like, great, sounds awesome. Um, I had a networking event I was going to later that day in New York to, to just, again, try to meet people, try to figure out my path. And so, you know, we spent that two to three hours. And even in that conversation, I can't even explain how much insight I got into myself. Like I learned so much about what do I love to do? What is there a market for in the world? What are the things I'm good at or could get good at? And then, you know, where is there a need that I can serve? And, you know, the intersection of those four things, I don't, if, if people are familiar with the concept, it's a Japanese concept called Ikigai, it's I-K-I-G-A-I. -I. That was kind of the framework for an exercise that my uncle ran through with me. And it, you know, it opened up my eyes. I took lots of notes and then I spent a few days just kind of sitting in that and reflecting on, on what I had learned and what we had talked about. And from that, that's actually how I, I figured out coaching was something I wanted to do. That's how I remembered, all right, you know what? I want to build a business. It's never going to get easier as, you know, I, we start a family, as you start to have kids and, you know, you get golden handcuffs and you start to be so tied to these things that are comfortable for us. So I said, you know what? I should, I should consider pursuing this now. Uh, cause I don't think it's going to get any easier. Okay. And so was this in girlfriend phase or wife phase? This was wife phase. So girlfriend phase ended right after graduation, we got engaged and then a year later became wife. Okay. And so you come home and you have the conversation, Hey babe, I don't want to work anymore. I want to do this. And <laughs> so I am so fortunate so blessed my wife is the most supportive person in my life like even even along the early stages of the entrepreneurial journey just the the faith and trust that she's had in me and knowing why i'm doing this and knowing that i'm trying to create a better life for our family in the future um so from the jump she has been insanely supportive she knew and she could see on my face every day i came home from work she was like i don't I don't want you to be like this because it's less fun for me. Like, it's just, it's, it's hard to see somebody that you love be in such a, a, a mental state like that, where it really takes a toll on you. So she was very supportive uh, from the start, which obviously that made it so much easier for me. I can't imagine what it would be like to, to have that desire and to feel pulled in that direction, but to then have, you know, the person who I, I married, not necessarily support that uh, that decision. So very fortunate in that way. Okay. And so you walk out into the desert and you realize how hot it is and <laughs> you don't see the water and you're like, okay, well, how long is this going to take me to get to the place where it's comfortable again? And a lot of people turn around and go back into, you know, the jungle. They, they don't want to enjoy the desert at all. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when, did you realize, hey, I'm out here. I've got to keep going. I call this the red pill moment. Yeah, it's a great question. So it's interesting because the taking that final step, like even throughout my last year working full time, when I was wrapping up my coaching training, 
there was still so much resistance, like trying to keep me in the jungle. It was, it was crazy. It was the craziest thing because in my head, realistically, I had decided I was going to do this thing, but as that jumping off point get, got closer and closer, I started to consider, oh man, maybe, maybe I should create an internal coaching role within my company. Then I get to coach, but then I also get the benefits and the salary and all the comfort. And it was just, I mean, again, like I said, I'm, I'm a person of faith. And so that's been a huge part of my journey. And it literally took like a very kind of obvious sign to say, you need to stop resisting because you're going to crush yourself. If you stay in this jungle, you're going, you're going to regret it. And so finally taking that leap, um, it was actually the day before I was going to meet with the director of HR to propose an internal coaching role that I made the decision, you know what, that's it, I'm leaving at the end of the year. And so instead of going in and pitch that proposal, I went in and said, hey, I was going to pitch a proposal, but I'm actually leaving at the end of the year. And so from then, you know, I'd say maybe in the first few months, there was a moment where I was like, you know, uh, can I do this? Is this, you know, can I make this work? Can I make this happen? And it's not to say that that com ever completely goes away. I think to a certain extent, there's always that voice that's, that's whispering that like, it'd be a lot easier if you just went back to the jungle. But I've been able to over time and through getting coaching of my own to really quiet that voice down. And I'm listening to the voice that's saying, no, I'm, I'm fully committed. And I'm all in. Like it's going to happen. It's inevitable, you know, getting to that place where, like you said, of, of being more comfortable, or I guess really more of a steady state or more of uh, a place of trusting, okay, this is, this is just my new normal now. Um, and I think getting to that place requires you to, to go all in on yourself and make that mindset switch and say, my success is inevitable in running my business. It's just a matter of how and when. And once you take that if question, out of your head and out of your focus, it frees up a lot of mental energy and time to really focus on the how and actually making it happen. Ooh, well, I hope you guys got that because he just gave you the bars. Okay, so bet on yourself, right? You cut the safety net, you got rid of that. I, I love the Batman situation where he's climbing up the wall and he makes the jump and he's got the rope attached, he falls down. And it does he doesn't make the jump until he makes it all the way across, right? But he didn't have any safety. He had no other choice. He's, this is what's going to happen. And I believe that I'm going to be successful in the endeavor. All right. So what happened on that day when you're walking down the hall to pitch it? There had to be something that said, all right, we're not doing this. We're going to tell them that we're leaving. What happened? Did somebody say something to you or what? So it was, it was actually the, the day before um, when I was, I was just having my quiet time, devotional time, I was reading my Bible and, and I journal my, my thoughts and my prayers and kind of just what's going on in my life to, to help me slow down and, and reflect. And in that moment, I was trying to, to figure everything out. I was trying to figure out what decision do I want to make? Do I want to pitch it? Do I not? And in that moment, you know, it, it's, it's really one of the only time, it's the only time in my life where I ever felt like I did hear a voice. It sounded like my voice in my head that said, just leave, Kieran, like just leave the job. And I was like, all right, well, that's, that's weird. I questioned it. I tried to push it to the side. And then a Bible verse popped into my head, which never happened before. Like I've, I, I became a, a believer, a Christian five, five years ago. And at that point, I wasn't in a place where just, you know, verses were popping up here and there. And I'm just like able to, uh, to stay it and say scripture, like off the top of my head. So I was like, that's really weird. That doesn't happen. It's also Old Testament. I was like, Old Testament's weird. But I decided to go and just read what was it like, what was it like, did it relate to the situation at all, which I didn't think it did. And then I read through it. And it's talking about this imagery of um, the Israelites long story short, they were in slavery in Egypt and God saved them and brought them out of slavery. And they were wandering in the desert. It's funny, you know, we're using that imagery. They're wandering in the desert and they're at this point where they're about to cross the Jordan river, which is like, that's the final step of this process of, of leaving slavery and stepping into freedom. And so it just, it was this passage that spoke directly into this conf this 
conflict and resistance I was feeling and going through. And ultimately, essentially the takeaway for me was take this step of faith, cross the Jordan River, step into the, you know, the promised land where there's, you know, there's, there's this freedom, there is this uh, unknown, but possibility and, and promise ahead of me. And so for me that, you know, I called up a few friends, I called my wife, because I, I always want to run that by people and make sure I'm not being crazy. I'm like, am I, what else are you, what would you read into this? What do you think? And, you know, people are like, seems pretty clear. And, you know, deep down, I knew it. And when I talked to my wife, it's funny, I told her, hey, this is what happened. She said, yeah, you need to leave. Like, I've known this all year. I've known that you need to leave the job, like, do it. So she was already there before I was. Um, but that was the moment when I, I made that decision. I was like, all right, you know what, tomorrow, I'm not going to pitch that proposal. I'm going to, I'm going to tell them I'm leaving. And the, I mean, that's a really exciting decision. Uh, there's definitely a, a huge weight lifted off my shoulders. Um, and then as you inch closer to that last day of work, you know, you get the, the jitters, you're like, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. There's lots of excitement, there's nervous energy. And yeah, so it was a, that was a, a pretty crazy series of days for me. What's up tribe, it's your host Jerome. I just wanna let you know that we put together a free 15 point checklist for exiting the matrix. Jump on over to dreamshouldbereal.com in order to pick your free copy up. Let's get back to the show not even close it's you know it even in that last year of working and going through my coach training i experienced so much growth i i realized all of the ways that i was holding myself back in my even in my nine to five like i would show up i would be in meetings with you know uh high level leaders and i would be afraid to voice my opinion i'd be afraid to challenge the status quo i'd be afraid to speak up when i felt like something wasn't uh fair or wasn't the right decision because i was so concerned with rocking the boat, looking like I was stupid. And I didn't get awareness around that until I, you know, I was getting coached around these things and realizing, wow, I do that. I hold myself back. I'm playing it safe in so many different ways. And for me, having that awareness going into entrepreneurship gave me at least that level of awareness to say, hey, this is probably going to show up in, in how I'm running my business. So I need to be aware of it. I need to continue working on it. Um, and so, you know, that's a, that's a constant journey of, of being willing to step out and be bold. And for me, the biggest thing I'm, I was a chronic people pleaser and it's something I, I fight to this day. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that. I just, I want to get people to like me. It's just kind of, it feels comfortable. It feels good, but sometimes getting people to like you is not what actually serves them. And if I'm going to be in business providing value for people, I want to be of service to them. I don't want them to I don't want to be so concerned with whether or not they like me. And so for me, that was, you know, that's a, a big thing that over the, the course of the first, I'd say six months of running my business, that, you know, that was something I did not do a great job at. I was still in that people pleasing, playing it safe, be comfortable, be afraid to really do what's in the best interest of my clients. And it wasn't until I, I, I made that switch that I really started to see progress. Um, and so that's one example of, of just something that, yeah, you, you jump into the entrepreneurial world, you, you walk into the desert, you finally cross that, that Jordan river and it's, it's not rainbow and sunshine. Um, there's still is. work to be done. Come on. There's work to be done. No, Karen, all the gurus say is rainbow and sunshine. It's all you have to do. Is <laughs> just follow the six step process. Yes. Yeah, it's that yeah. simple. So what's, what was your worst fear in the process? What was my, what is my, what is, or what was my worst fear? What was, what was my worst fear? So, you know, I think failure realistically, it was the business not getting to the point where it could sustain my family. And then feeling like, feeling like I failed and then having, feeling like I had to go back, right. Go back to the jungle or go back to the drawing board and, and get that, that nine to five. Like for me, that my biggest fear was, not succeeding and feeling like, you know what, I have to go back. Um, that was, that was the biggest thing that, that gripped me and that said, you have to avoid this at all costs. Otherwise, you know, you're, you're a failure. And, you know, that, even that fear and that mindset, like the way that I just framed that is not how I think about it today, because ultimately succeeding as an entrepreneur, that's not the one thing that's going to 
shape my identity as a human being. You know, that's a, it's a part of me. It's something that I want to do. It's something that I like doing, but that cannot be the thing that determines my self-worth and my feeling as though like I am a, a worthy, lovable human being. Um, and so that's a, it's a really tough concept and a really tough shift to make. And that's one that, you know, I'd say, I think that's a shift that I'm constantly trying to make and just keep moving it, inching it closer and closer to, yeah, my identity is not totally wrapped up in my career success. You know, it's, it's a, there's a bigger picture for me. Ooh. So you mean your title at your job isn't the end all be all? No, it's not the, not the title, not the salary, not the number of people that you lead, not, uh, you know, any of these things, the size of your bonus, none of that stuff. It's, it's funny because in my nine to five, you know, I had, I, from a young age, I had a great title. I was managing people. I had a great salary. I got great bonuses. And I was like, yeah, but you know, that's not part of my identity. You know, I don't, I don't need that stuff to be, to be happy and feel worthy. And then you take that stuff away, right? You walk away from it and you realize, okay, maybe that was part of, of how I was seeing myself. And, and so it, you know, it's, it's honestly, it's been kind of a cool process to really, to see that and to try to disentangle that and, and detach those two things. Yeah. I remember when I realized that people were being nice to me because of the title I had and not because of who I was. <laughs> it's heartbreaking when you first realize it, but then you realize, Hey, you know, it is what it is and you move on. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> Was there a point when everything was on the line? Did you have a rock bottom yet? Everything on the line. It's an interesting, interesting question. I wouldn't say I've had a rock bottom. I've certainly had those moments where you start to, you question, you're like, am I going, right? Like I make that commitment. I'm betting on myself. I'm all in, I'm going to do this. And then you, you experience some things, uh, you know, a bad, month or bad interactions with potential clients where, you know, things don't go the way that you want to, or you fall back into that people pleasing thing and it ends up hurting the business. And yeah, I mean, there are those moments where I've, I've questioned, I've said, all right, what am I asked myself, what am I going to do? Am I going to keep pushing forward or am I going to stop? Is this where it all ends? And when I get to that moment, you know, now I feel like I'm at the point where I don't live in that questioning phase for very long. It might happen in that moment, might happen for five minutes, but then I, I get to the point I'm able to either work with my coach or, or coach myself to the point of, no, let me remember all the reasons why I am going to keep going, why this is going to be part of my story. And when I look back, I can say, yeah, these are the moments where, you know, the, the thought of quitting, the thought of giving up popped into my head, but I wasn't listening to that voice. I chose to listen to, to the voice calling me forward, calling me to step into courage and overcoming the adversity. And so, yeah, I wouldn't say I've had the, uh, like a singular rock bottom moment, but certainly moments where, you know, that voice starts to get a little bit louder of, Hey, is this going to work? Are you going to, are you going to go back to, to the jungle? Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of been the experience up to, up to this point. All right. So, you're performing well. You walk out. I'm going to do my own thing. Did the phone ring and anybody ask you to come back in and enjoy the lush vegetation of the jungle? Come on. <laughs> Not, I wouldn't, I didn't get a phone call. Um, I do get, or I did get a lot of people just reaching out, checking in, like saying, you know, how's it going? Blah, blah, blah. It's funny. Uh, I had some people who I worked with who were interested in what I was doing and were considering doing something similar, stepping out, you know, stepping out of the jungle. Um, but there were, it's, it's funny, there are people close to me in my life, I'm not afraid to say, and I, I have a great relationship with my in-laws, but I'll, I'll throw up my mother-in-law. She had the mindset, right? I think more of my parents' generation, they just have that mindset of get a good job, stay there till you retire. Like that's stability, that's how you provide a good life for your family. Uh, there was less opportunity for entrepreneurship than there is today. And, you know, 
she knew all the, all the passion I had and all, all the why behind what I was doing and, and what I was going to be building towards. And she understood it. And there was still, I rem distinctly remember this experience. I was in their kitchen, you know, we were having a family dinner and, you know, the, the topic of the business came up and it was right before I was about to leave. And she, it was like a, a, a gut, like knee jerk reaction, like didn't even think about it. It just came out of her. And she said, I can't believe, I can't believe you're leaving this great job with these great benefits and great pay. And it's funny, my wife looked at her and she was like, why would you say that? Um, and I, you know, I thought it was funny at the time. I was just like, that's, you know, that's how deeply ingrained that, that thinking can be. Um, so that's, you know, that's a moment I'd, I'd say that's characteristic of, I think people who heard about what I was doing, you know, maybe they said like, oh, good for you. They say that, but in their head, they're thinking, you know, that's kind of crazy. That's not going to work out. I don't think that's going to be a great decision. So, you know, I'm sure that there's some of that going on, but. Oh, without question. Right. I mean, and they're being polite and some people just want a front row seat to your failure and <laughs> that's okay, but you know, you got to really figure out who's in and who's out on your thing. Right. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Now that you are outside and you're living in this new space, you got a successful coaching practice and you're helping people achieve their wildest dreams. What's the biggest difference in your approach to life? Hmm. That's a great question. Biggest difference in my approach to life. I just, I feel more at home, I just feel like I'm more in my natural state. And so it's, I feel like I now, given the, the time freedom and the space freedom to really dictate what my day-to-day -day looks like, has allowed me to very clearly and very, not easily, but very clearly see how my priorities in life, my values are lining up or not lining up with how I'm spending my time. Like, I just, I feel like I have so much more mental clarity to be able to see that picture clearly. And the fact that I can see that clearly allows me to live more in alignment with, with my values. Like the amount of time and the pandemic is part of it, but even before that, the amount of time that I now get to spend with my family, with my friends, doing the things that I love is dramatically higher than it was previously. And so there's, you know, the, I'd say my approach to life hasn't necessarily changed from like a, a super big picture perspective. Um, but I think the way that I've been able to live out my approach to life has become more enjoyable, more aligned and, and just more impactful for me. And I'm not, I don't know if that makes sense. I don't know how uh, vague that is maybe to you or to, to people listening, but. It certainly isn't vain for me. And of course it makes sense to me because Foundationally, I believe that life isn't so much about these pursuit of these massive goals. It's about doing more of the things you want to do and less of the things you don't, right? And not because you're seeking comfort, but because those things are aligned with your values and morals. And so complete and total sense for me in what you just described. What are you most grateful for? Well, my daughter was born a month ago. Um, I think I honestly, I, I'm most grateful for my family right now, especially given just the current situation, 2020 pandemic, um, having like the closest people to me in my life be with me, be supportive, uh, you know, just loving me and, and being there for me. I'm so grateful for that. And so, you know, we're a family, now we're a family of four. So we also have a, a one, just turned one year old foster son um, who we've, we've had with us since he was three and a half weeks old and just getting to spend time with, with him, see him become a big brother to my daughter and just have this, this time as a young family. It's, it's been so much fun. And every, like literally every day I do uh, just a gratitude visualization. I, I picture just moments, like small moments that I'm grateful for. And the first two things I always think of are just seeing my foster son laugh 
or seeing my daughter smile. And it's just like, there's nothing better than that. I love it. When are you going to drop Foster and he's just going to be your son? <sighs> Boy, the timing of that and, uh, and this question and, and this interview is impeccable because today there was a court date just based on for his situation. Um, it's going to be a long journey. We don't know 100% if we will get to adopt him. It, there are, it's dependent on whether or not his parents take certain actions or don't. Up to date, they have not taken the right actions. And so his case is moving towards adoption, but it's still going to be another 12 to 24 months before anything is, is finalized. So short answer is I don't know. Um, if that does happen, we will welcome it and, and would be excited for that. You know, we want what's best for him. And so we'll see, I'll let you know. Yeah. I, that thing's tough, right? You bring somebody into your home, you love on them. They can depend on you completely. And the thought of having to let them go away after that is just, That's I don't terrible. know how you, I don't know how you could do it. And so it's, it's really interesting, but I, there's so many children who end up in these really rough situations and to be able to have people who care about them and love on them is it's just a great blessing for you. So kudos to you and the wife for doing that for sure. Thank you. Appreciate that. Karen, what dream are you most focused on catching next? Ooh, for me, it's, it's scaling, it's scaling the business um, and just scaling the impact that I can have and reaching more people. So, I mean, I work with, with Christian business owners and entrepreneurs. And for me, that looks like right now, it looks like scaling beyond, you know, one-on-one -on -one work with people into smaller group coaching, as well as creating uh, a larger community, you know, a larger community of people who are dedicated to living out their faith through their business and doing incredibly excellent work, having a, you know, kingdom impact on the people that they interact with. Uh, and using business as a way to do that. It's such a cool way to, to serve other people and to love other people. Um, so to be able to enable more people to do that and to do that well, and to bring those folks together right now, that's, that's the big dream that's on the horizon for me is, is really this communal aspect of connecting Christian entrepreneurs with each other and equipping them with the tools and the resources to be able to go out and, and do their work even better and at a higher level. So we're down to the final two. The first of those two is what gift are you giving the world? What gift am I giving the world? So I think I, I my old self would say, uh, that's, that feels really uh, weird to answer that question. It feels cocky or feels arrogant, but you know, the more that I've come into in tune with, you know, why I'm here on this earth and, and what things I've been given, uh, the talents and resources that I've been given, you know, boil it all down. I'm trying to give love to the world. And the only way I can do that is because I've been filled up with it and I'm constantly filled up with it. And so to be able to share that with the world, that is, I mean, that's how you most succinctly can uh, summarize my purpose and every, the reason for everything that I do. It's, it's just to, to share love with other people. Beautiful. So when people ask me about faith and everything else that they ask about, I tell them I believe in one thing. There's one law. It's the law of love. And so if you can love on others, then the yeah. world's a great place. And the moment that you're doing anything other than loving on them, that's when bad things start to happen. So yep. definitely can resonate with that one. All right, Karen. So I wrap up every interview with the same question. And the one question is, what is the one thing that you want people to take away from our conversation? Hmm. The one thing that I want people to take away is when you are faced with a decision to keep going and keep betting on yourself and trusting yourself that you have what it takes to pursue and, and achieve whatever that, that dream, that goal, that thing in front of you that you want, when you have that decision point, make that decision for the future version of yourself, not for the present version of yourself. Because the present version of yourself wants comfort, it wants 
safety. It wants the known. It wants everything that feels good in the moment. But when you start making decisions for your future self, that's when you'll start to, to really push yourself forward. So that's, that's one thing I want to leave with folks. <laughs> You're creating problems for people now because they don't have an excuse. They don't have an excuse not to live out their best life. They don't have an excuse not to live out their dreams. They, they can't say, but I want to stay in the jungle because there's fruit and honey and all of the water I can drink. Like everything's here. Why would I ever want to go out into the desert and do the hard stuff, right? Yeah, I, I appreciate you challenging folks that way. Guys, I, I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I have. Um, again, Karen, thank you so much for being so generous with your time and sharing all your wisdom and your journey. Appreciate all the transparency and authenticity. Guys, until the next time, your dreams should be real. We'll talk soon. Thank you for joining the tribe today. We would love to hear from you. Please don't forget to rate, like, and share. Perhaps someone you know could benefit from what we've discussed. Until the next time, remember that your dreams should be real.